Yes. That's wonderful. Took a ride around town come evening, and there's something magical in these cool Carolina nights. I must remark on the immense psychological benefit of exposure, how essential it is to appreciating the comforts of hearth and home. With all those wonderful amenities that modern living provides to us when we stick around indoors all the time, venturing out is sometimes a difficult thing. You get sucked in, like when you're trying to get off of a well-worn couch. A couch whose magic is both created and ruined by overuse. That's why tonight's little expedition was so exhilarating. The exercise and the mild thrill of the dark corners of that one wooded dirt road in the back of a neighborhood I used to live in, these provided the contrast to the fiery comfort of scotch and high-speed internet that I so desperately needed. I really think there is a deeper phenomenon here than suburban malaise. I think that a lot of our modern psychological problems can be attributed to our ignoring the ancient need to range. So, I've replenished my whiskey till next weekend rolls around. This time, instead of the Founder's Reserve, I have the Glenlivet 12, which is aged in double oak barrels. The clerk that sold it to me also recommended an American single malt from Virginia, but... It was about $70 for 750 milliliters, if I recall correctly. Ah, uh, touch too much for my purse. Also, I'm a bit suspicious of any sort of American brewing or distilling. While there are lots of great American whiskeys and beers, there's a corner cutting in production that I'm just not a fan of. Traditions like Reinheitsgebot help to curb U.S.-style capitalistic exuberance on the European side. Now, I'm not sure if the whiskey the clerk recommended is guilty of anything that I found in the article I'm about to read from, but the general information does confirm the wisdom of my snobbery. So, from whiskeyadvocate.com. In Scotland, malt whiskey is always made using 100% malted barley. In the U.S., many malt whiskeys, especially those labeled single malt, are made with 100% malted barley as well. But they don't have to be. <coughs> Excuse me. U.S. regulations stipulate that malt whiskey is only required to have a minimum of 51% malted barley in the mash bill. Like bourbon and rye, the maximum proofs for distillation and barrel entry for American malt whiskey are 160 and 125, respectively. Additionally, it must be stored in new charred oak barrels. Therefore, American malt whiskeys are closer kissing cousins to bourbon and American rye than they are to scotch single malts. Now, I've only recently begun my whiskey journey, and I'll update everybody on stuff I found out as I progress, so corrections and suggestions are encouraged. Now, back to waxing poetic about the merits of Carolina evenings. One thing that I found particularly catalytic for stirring vague sentiments of an internal tapestry is being in places at the same time of day as I was when I had formative or otherwise grand experiences. So, a uh, relationship some half-decade distance now had found me in an old-style home with a lover, an old-style home which was really reminiscent of the sort I dwelt in when I first came to the States. That's a story for another time, but it'll make this make a lot more sense as uh, why it's such a prominent part of my consciousness. Anyway, an old style home that had this small but cozy closing interior and it mixed so neat with the night outside the kitchen door, so tidily. There were cigarettes and gin in the sense that I was stringing along some kind of coherency in these old dwellings. The dirty blonde hair with just a hint of reddish hue, was so vibrant, so full of fresh life among that venerable bit of Americana. And that's kind of what I recalled as I was riding my bike past my old house this evening, and just the feel of the evening air, the, the particular humidity in this part of the country at this time of year. Ugh, she did say a lot of stupid shit, though. <laughs> 
Uh, let's turn to less local affairs and read about a newly found exoplanet. This article is from mysteriousuniverse.org and is written by Jocelyn LeBlanc. Let's begin. Where did it go? Where did the article go? There it is. Scientists were studying data collected by NASA's Kepler spacecraft when they made a pretty interesting discovery. They found an Earth-sized planet that may potentially be able to support life. The exoplanet is named Kepler 1649c, and it orbits a red dwarf star that's located approximately 300 light years away from Earth. What's so interesting about this exoplanet is that it's situated in a habitable zone as it completes a full orbit around the star every 19.5 Earth days. While that may seem like a really short orbital time to be in the habitable zone, it actually makes a lot of sense since red dwarfs are so dim that their just right zone is fairly close. And Kepler 1649c isn't alone, as it has a neighboring planet called Kepler 1649b, but it orbits the star at approximately half the distance, so it's more than likely way too hot to host any type of life. So that's very, very interesting, the local conditions for life being different around the red dwarf. Um, and there's a lot of red dwarfs in our galaxies, as this article goes on to say. So the chances are high that among one of these, we're going to find an Earth-like planet. And if it's an Earth-like planet, it most likely has life. So hey, you know, I always thought, especially since I read the Michael Crichton book Sphere and such, well, would aliens necessarily even look anything like us? We have this kind of predilection of making them uh, bi bipedal and having this body dimorphism. Uh, it's very similar to the way that we have it. I think dimorphism is the right word, that kind of like bifurcation, bilateral symmetry. Yeah, yeah, that's... But maybe if they come from an Earth-like planet, they would have bilateral symmetry. You know, you never know. Maybe the gray aliens are real and they're going to come and put stuff in your butthole. Oh my goodness, there's an ad here. One thing all cheaters have in common. Those are some great legs on that gal. That's ridiculous. Such clickbait. All right. Well, it is exactly midnight right now. And unfortunately, this is a lot shorter than I wanted to make it. But hopefully it brought you a little bit of joy this evening. Now, that little picture that I used as the thumbnail for this bit of audio is me holding what I suppose is a flintlock sniper rifle, and I call it my Freedom Boomstick. It's 1776 inches long. Well, it's not really, but I just thought it was funny. The Scottish flag and the, and the Scotty hat and just, yeah, defended my scotch from communism. Because, all joking aside... We do need to take our freedom and our culture seriously. But that doesn't mean we have to take ourselves seriously. My main website is FractalJournal.com, where you'll find stories, ideas, and more. The program you just heard is called TFS, or the Fractal Standard, which is a daily variety show full of, well, variety. Cheers. <laughs>